Hey, so I'm working on a project right now to build my own AM transmitter. Uh, as you know, I recently finished the Philco 116X restoration, and uh, well, there are not really any good AM stations around here. We get some sp uh, Spanish speaking stations, a couple sports stations, uh, crazy political nuts, crazy religious nuts, uh, nothing particularly musical. So what I figured I'd do is try to design my own AM transmitter. Uh, yeah, sure, there's kits out there. Um, there's the Ramsey AM transmitter kit. Um, SS Tran also makes a uh, AM transmitter kit that I'm aware of. Um, there's probably others, but I, I haven't researched that deep. But I thought, you know, it'd be more interesting to design and build my own AM transmitter instead of uh, buying one that's already on the market. So thus, that is why you see the circuitry on the breadboard in front of you here. Uh, this is my prototype, or the beginnings of a prototype for an AM transmitter. It's not all there, but uh, it's a starting point. It's enough to uh, make some noise in a radio. But uh, I don't want to go all that in depth all at once. Uh, I want to start right at the beginning, start block by block, and work our way up to having the final transmitter. So I'm going to make this another series similar to the Nixie Tube clock project, which, by the way, I've completed. Uh, I've got a couple more videos I need to make of that, and you might recognize this leftovers from the Nixie Tube power supply. Uh, so ignore that. That's not part of it. This isn't part of it. That's just someplace that I stuck things. Anyway, let's get to it, and let's look at the first item that you'll need to make an AM transmitter. Okay, so maybe it isn't something that you need to make an AM transmitter, but if you want to make a decent one, not some shitty one, you're going to want to have a let's see what I point there, crystal get that stuff out of the way, crystal such as this one. That's a 4 megahertz crystal. We've got a couple uh, load capacitors here and we've got a series dropping resistor and a uh, load resistor on there as well and that's going to this logic gate here. Um, so basically that gives us a stable frequency that uh, our AM transmitter will be disciplined to. Uh, so let's talk about something that I think often gets overlooked in digital designs, the crystal oscillator. Okay, so this is a topic I think we're all relatively familiar with as digital designers. Uh, we have drawn out for you here Say this is your microcontroller, and somewhere attached to that microcontroller, maybe I'll make that bigger so you can see it. Why not? I've got all this board space. So you've got your micro microcontroller. From that, you've got a crystal and a couple capacitors and that is your oscillator for the microcontroller uh, but do you know how that works? do you know how to design it properly? Uh, do you know what circuitry is inside here? question mark well today we're going to go through and I'm going to show you how this works and I think you'll see pretty soon how it actually relates to an AM transmitter. Okay, so uh, to start here, this is known as a Pyrrhus gate oscillator. Uh, probably didn't know that, did you? Uh, I didn't know it until recently, so don't feel bad. Uh, so what I've drawn out here is, you can see this upper portion is the electronics that's usually inside the microcontroller, stuff that you didn't know was there. Um, sometimes it varies a little bit. Uh, occasionally you'll see that this feedback resistor, RF, um, will be on the outside there, probably around one meg, something like that. Uh, I know a lot of freescale microprocessors are that way. And uh, sometimes in low frequency, especially with like watch crystals around 32 kilohertz, um, your series resistor is going to be external as well. Um, not always, but sometimes. Um, and you definitely, especially for a watch crystal, um, when the power that a crystal can handle uh, without being destroyed is one microwatt, tiny, tiny amount, uh, RS is extremely important and it needs to be a high value to protect uh, your crystal. So, 
Why is it called a Pierce gate oscillator? Well, because you have an inverter gate and that is what gives you your phase shift required in order to uh, sustain oscillation. Okay, so what do we uh, need to satisfy as far as criteria in order to uh, sustain oscillations? Well, that's uh, critical to this circuit as with any oscillator and uh, you might remember this if you had gone to EE school, the gain around the loop, meaning within this circuitry, uh, including the feedback, uh, needs to be greater than one because if you have negative feedback, well, you're not gonna sustain oscillations and uh, well, it's not gonna work. That's why that's one of our criteria. Uh, number two, the phase shift, that means between this gate here and the remainder of your components needs to be either zero, no phase shift, or a multiple of 360. Um, basically meaning no phase shift uh, between any of the components. Because if you have, say, a 180 degree phase shift, well, you're gonna have one signal that looks like that, and then another with a 180 degree phase shift that looks like that, and guess what? They've entirely canceled each other out, so that's not gonna work you need something that is going to be in phase, so you've got one signal there, and then say another one there, and it's going to be additive, and it's gonna to continue to add to that signal as it goes around the loop, which sustains the oscillation. So obviously we get 180 degrees phase shift there from the inverter, because your output is going to be 180 degrees out of phase with your input, and that will be actually minus 180. And uh, the remainder of your components needs to make up the other minus 180 degrees. And generally it will if you've designed this properly, so not a problem. Um, one note about the gate in this instance, uh, the inverter gate isn't terribly picky with modern technology, but you need to choose a gate which is plenty fast for the frequency that you wanna be operating at. Uh, in this instance, my crystal, X and T, is 4 megahertz. So you need to be able to choose an inverter that's at least 4 megahertz. I'd recommend an order of magnitude better, uh, probably about a 40 megahertz response rate. Not a problem with modern technology. I did choose a high-speed version, so uh, it works just fine. So let's look at the individual elements of the oscillator one at a time. Uh, we've already looked at the inverter, uh, so I'm not going to go too in-depth with that. Uh, but let's look at the feedback resistor first. What is that there for? Well, the feedback resistor works in conjunction with the inverter itself. Uh, there is a parasitic capacitance, uh, basically on the pins and internal to the oscillator, or to the gate rather, itself. There is a parasitic capacitance to ground on both the output and the input respectively. So this feedback resistor works in conjunction with the capacitance on the pins of the gate and the internal capacitance, those parasitic capacitances, to make this more of a linear amplifier. Um, but it's going to be a linear amplifier with a 180 degree phase shift, which as we saw sustains the oscillations. So this value, RF, not particularly critical. Uh, for something like this, RF equals, we're going to go with, say, 1 mega ohm. So a typical oscillator of, say, in this instance, 4 megahertz, 1 mega ohm is a good value. But if you were to go up to, say, 20 megahertz, 470K would probably be a more typical value. If you're going down to uh, watch crystal type, 10 to 15 mega ohms would be pretty common. So uh, there's quite a wide range. Uh, it's not very picky about what RF is. Uh, you can play around with it to get the best stability, um, but in general, RF is not an extremely critical value. So one meg is going to be more than adequate here. Okay, so that brings us to RS. RS is the series protection resistor, more or less. Uh, what this does is it limits the current going to your crystal from your gate and your feedback circuitry there. Um, it also helps isolate, just in general, uh, the crystal circuitry from the gate circuitry up there. Um, and it gives you a degree of 
control over what your output amplitude ends up being out of this oscillator. Um, which, by the way, your output from the oscillator, uh, you could take an output here, or you can take an output right there. Um, they're going to be 180 degrees out of phase from each other. If it doesn't matter, then uh, not a problem. Uh, I do believe in my design I had taken the output here. Let me look. Hold on. Uh, yes, that's correct. The output is, in fact, taken from here. Uh, so, yeah, doesn't matter. You'll, they'll, they'll both work, um, but, yeah, either way. Uh, so, RS, in this instance, uh, in order to find RS, we need to actually calculate what these two load capacitors are. So let me move on to that. We're going to kind of skip over what that value is for now. And let's talk about the load capacitors. So when you buy a crystal um, from any given manufacturer, it's going to have a certain ESR and it's going to have a certain load value that it requires in order for it to oscillate properly. Uh, so a typical value might be, say, 33 picofarads or 20 picofarads or 15 picofarads, um, typically around in that range. So what that means is uh, this here is going to be oscillating at a given frequency. We know that frequency is 4 megahertz. And one thing that we know about capacitors is they have capacitive reactants. X sub C equals 1 over 2 pi times F times C. So, knowing that our frequency is 4 megahertz, and uh, we can take the typical value of the load capacitance that we get from the data sheet. In this instance, the data sheet asks for 33 picofarads. Typically, you want to set these to the same value. Um, you can actually make CL1 higher. You would typically want to be about twice as high or uh, two standard values higher than uh, CL2. And what that does is it can kind of help give you some uh, linearity if you're having issues with that. Typically though, that, that's not a big problem. You want to keep these two equal. Um, there is technically a formula for finding out what that load capacitance is, and it includes the parasitic capacitances of your gate. It also includes the parasitic capacitance of your print circuit board. Uh, unfortunately, you don't know what the capacitance, the parasitic capacitance of your PCB is going to be until you've actually already manufactured a printed circuit board. So for this phase, your design phase, you can kind of estimate, you know, it's going to be two or three picofarad um, on each one. You're going to have maybe four or five picofarad on the input and output for each one. Um, typically, a lot of the data sheets for logic, they don't tell you what the parasitic capacitance for the pins is. Um, sometimes for the high speed logic, because capacitance really matters then, uh, they do actually provide it. And the values I've seen for like HS, uh, like 74 HS series high speed logic is uh, right around, we'll say five picofarads each. So call it five there plus another two or three down here. And uh, you know, plus the load capacitance for this crystal, which actually in this instance is 20 picofarads. And uh, it comes out to be about 30 picofarads when you add those parasitics in. Um, you know, again, with just an estimate of what the, the PCB parasitic will be. We don't know yet. Uh, but of course, once it's built, we can actually measure that parasitic and come back and verify that assumption. Um, so anyway, I, I'm going to make CL1 and CL2. CL1 equals CL2 equals... 33 picofarads, because that's the next standard value up from 30 picofarads. Uh, so, as I was saying, uh, we don't exactly know what the parasitic capacitances of these two will be uh, with everything else in the circuit. Uh, and the result of that is, if you don't have the proper load, and again, these are presenting a load to the crystal because you have capacitive reactants. Um, which is essentially an impedance, which is going to be a load on that crystal. If you don't have the proper load for the given frequency, uh, you're not going to operate 
at that frequency, you might be off by some amount. Um, typically it's in parts per million, um, but you could be uh, off by as much as you know, 0.01% or 0.05%. It doesn't sound like much, but for frequency critical applications, uh, that could add up to a huge difference. So uh, you definitely want to, as a post-process step, verify the frequency this is operating at after you've actually built the PCB. And if you're off by a significant amount, uh, you can either compensate by changing these load capacitor values or a lot of times you have the ability to actually calibrate this internal in the software on the microcontroller, real-time clock chips also usually have that ability, but you can only calibrate to a certain degree. Um, you can only do, say, perhaps 100 ppm in either direction. So if you're vastly off, then you only have the choice of changing these capacitors. Um, and then, you know, any other amount that you want to tune out, you can later on in software. And if you're mass producing something, if you're building, say, a hundred thousands of these, uh, you don't want to be changing things every single time. You want to get the value perfect and you want to stick to that. So, uh, yeah, you don't want to be going down that path. Uh, anyhow, I want to go ahead and calculate what the actual reactants of these capacitors are because that's going to help us determine what RS is and a good rule of thumb is that RS equals the X sub C L, the capacitive reactance of the load capacitor. Um, so if we have, oh and I should have this ready, let me get my calculator, I should have been ready, I never am. Got it? Okay. So we're going to do 1 over 2 times pi times our frequency, 4 megahertz, 4 times 10 to the 6th, times our capacitance, which is 33 picofarads, which is 33 times 10 to the minus 12. Comes out to be 1200, and I'm going to round to 1206 ohms. So that is 1 over 2 pi times 4 meg. Sorry about that, my camera actually died on me. I'm gonna try and rush through the end of this here, sorry, uh, but I just charged the camera for a few minutes. Don't know how much longer it'll last. Uh, so anyway, uh, what did I do with my marker? Let me grab that. We've got our value there, RS equals X sub CL equals 1.2K, well, they're about, almost. Uh, and so that would be a very sensible choice for the series resistor, and in fact, that is what I chose. 1.2K ohm. So we've designed it. We've got our gate, uh, we've got our feedback, our series resistor, our two load capacitors, and of course our crystal, which is the first thing we pick because we know what frequency we want to operate at already. So I hope that helped. I know it was uh, kind of rushed through. It's a little bit chaotic here on the whiteboard, but wanted to give you an idea, at least have some look at what is typically inside a microcontroller that gives you your nice, stable, clean sine wave, sine wave output um, oscillations. Uh, you can get very stable frequencies with this type of oscillator. Uh, I highly recommend that you go and build a discrete version on your breadboard. These are common parts that everybody usually has in their junk bin. So yeah, go for it. Try to build one up and uh, you know, have fun with it. Get your uh, oscilloscope out and see what kind of frequency you get. All right, I know nobody would be satisfied unless I went ahead and showed the waveform. Uh, it's not as clean as I would have liked. I do see a couple little notches in there. Um, some kind of like uh, crossover distortion, possibly from the gate itself, uh, or that could be ground bounce from the rest of the circuit. That could very well be, since we're running relatively high speed, four megahertz on a breadboard, which uh, <laughs> definitely not ideal. All kinds of stray return paths, um, parasitic capacitances and inductances, not the best. Um, so anyway, you can see we have a amplitude of uh, 1.3 volts RMS, which uh, gives us about, what are we, 1 volt per division, 
2 volts peak, 4 volts peak to peak, so we have a really good size signal. And sorry about that, my camera actually died again. How annoying. Anyway, uh, so you can see that uh, we have a, a nice amplitude of about 4 volts peak to peak, uh, although that could easily be loaded down if you put too much of a load on it. Um, but it would be good enough to clock in some logic chips. Those have relatively high input impedances. Uh, and you can see there's software frequency counter down here, kind of jumping by between 3.97 and 4.03 megahertz. Don't trust that. That's not that great. But up here we have our hardware frequency counter, which shows 3.99993 megahertz. Uh, more than good enough for the application that I'm doing, uh, especially after I divide the frequency down. Uh, so, yeah, not a problem. Uh, I hope you found this interesting, and uh, I hope you follow this series that I'm about to do on the AM transmitter design. Uh, this was just the beginning, just to kick it off. And I promise I'll charge my camera next time, and we won't have to deal with my battery dying over and over again. Anyway, I'll see you next time. Bye.